So one of the things my family does every Christmas season is we do a marathon of watching Lord of the Rings. And uh, this year we were watching it, and I'm getting ready to be a grandfather and everything else. And so my kid said, Dad, you know, you're getting to that point in your life where you should maybe, like, start smoking a pipe. <laughs> and they're like, but not like any pipe. You have to have a pipe like Gandalf's pipe. And I'm like, yeah, I want a Gandalf pipe. But then today I realized I want a Chris Heyman pipe. That pipe. <laughs> that would be an epic pipe, man. If you're sitting on my back porch. Yeah, no, give Chris a hand. That was fantastic. I'm like, man, I want that pipe. I want like three people to carry it out and I can just be fantastic. So anyway, my name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here. I have the joy of sharing with you today uh, the celebration all about the birth of Christ. And I think the best way to start is really to start with prayer. It settles our hearts. It gets us in tune with the story. And uh, I think what God may have uh, to share with each one of us. And so if you would pray with me, I'd really appreciate that. That'd be great. Jesus, I thank you for this story that is really the birth point of not only a change in the world, but it's this story that resonates through cultures and shapes lives, and it's a story that's so unlike anything we would write. And so I thank you that you do things upside down and backwards, that you embed the very message of your kingdom in the narrative of all your different stories that you tell throughout the Bible. And so I thank you for the chance to tell this special story today that changed everything. And so we thank you, Jesus. We love you and praise you in your perfect and good name. Amen. So Advent, this is what we have been celebrating as a church now for a number of weeks, and it's really culminating in today. And if you're not familiar with this word, it just means arrival or coming. And it gets used in all sorts of different ways. For example, we might say there was this time where there was the advent of the printing press, or the advent of flight, or even more recently, the advent of the internet. So thank you, Al Gore, for inviting the, inventing the internet. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have Instagram and Twitter and memes and all of this great harmony that the internet has created in our culture. So, right? So, like, those are all Advent things. But when Christians talk about Advent, this is a very particular and precise word for us. Because in that word, we are capturing this incredible idea that God became man to rescue and redeem. To do it in this way that was going to be unforeseeable, slightly crazy to the way human beings perceive everything. And yet it was going to be good news of great joy. What I find in this though is that the way that God did this and the way the whole narrative flows and unfolds for us. It's a scandalous advent. Like every part of it is scandalous. Like I just prayed about. It's not the story we would write. But to understand the story, I think to see all of the kind of the gritty challenge of the story, we have to start off by disrupting our sentimental vision of the story. Because what happens so often is we we have this picture in our mind because, again, we've kind of crafted the story within our culture in certain ways. And so we picture this image that is much like uh, the image of this card right here. This image is uh, one of the most popular Christmas cards uh, that has been around for a long time in American culture. And, and that's sort of the picture that we have. We set up our nativities and all that. And we go, that's, that's the story. But when I see this image, it reminds me of this image right here. When I was a kid, there was a magazine called Highlights. Remember this? And you would get to this particular picture and it was like circle everything that's wrong in the picture. Right? Remember that? Let's go back to our Christmas card. Pretty much every part of this picture is wrong, all right? Like when we read the Bible story of the birth of Christ, here's a few things we need to know about this particular picture and why it's wrong. At the night in which he's born, we see three kings of Orientar. Here's the problem. Not three, not kings, not from the Orient, and not even there on the night of his birth. In fact, we see in the Gospel of Matthew, they come a full maybe one and a half to two years later, right? Another thing we don't see on the night of his birth is the appearance of a star. We don't see that ever coming up on the night of his birth. You're like, man, alive, what else happens? Well, the angels at Jesus' birth hovering over him, they're present where he is physically present. We don't see any angels physically present at the birth of Jesus, not with him. 
We don't see any animals or livestock. That beautiful song where ox and ass lay bleeding. We just like that song because it lets us cuss one time a year at church. Right? So, so all these things get disrupted pretty quickly. I mean, even this, this idea that it's in a barn. We're going to see that in a minute. Probably not a barn. Uh, December 25th, 0 AD, B.C. Uh, not December 25th, not 0 AD, B.C., probably more like 4 B.C., and in some of the warmer months, because the shepherds are in their fields at night with their sheep, which means it was warmer, it's not winter, like all of this happens. And so as I look at this card and I think about our nativities, I'm reminded of Buddy the Elf and his wisdom, all right, which is... Our nativities sit on a throne of lies, all right? Right? You're like, no, why did we just not go to Timberlake today? That would have been so much better. You know, like, why did we come to redemption where Matt gets to destroy everything? Yes, you're welcome. So, here to destroy stuff. But here, I'm doing that for a reason, all right? Because I think the real beauty of the story is seen, not when we want to be all sentimental about it, but when we want to get to the actual innards of the story and the amazing thing that it teaches. Because I think it teaches something far more amazing than what we sort of set up in our minds. Because what the story is about is this scandalous appearing of a very unique king. He is the scandalous king. And to set the stage for this, I I want to open with an ancient inscription. This is what it read. Here we commemorate the arrival of the anointed one, the holy one, the divine son of God. The beginning of the good news who has brought peace on earth as the savior of the world. Now as Christians we hear that and it sort of resonates with us. And we go, yes, that's right, that's it. But here's the thing about this inscription. It is written of Caesar, the holy Augustus. So, at that time, in that place, under that king, with those descriptions, God sends his king. And he sends his king, not as a conqueror, but as a child, And he doesn't send this child to the well-connected, but rather to the marginalized. He doesn't go to the established. He actually goes to the nomadic of the culture. And it's not to the respected people, but rather he is going to appear to the distrusted people in the hills of Judea. That makes it scandalous. So, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says, at that time, the Roman emperor Augustus, which means the holy, decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken under Cornelius, the governor of Syria. So all needed to return to their own ancestral town to register for the census. Now, if you were with us earlier in the month, the, the Gospel of Luke starts by mentioning it was the days of Herod, king of the Jews. And so Herod was the local tyrant. But here we're introduced to the global emperor, right? And you got to understand understand some things about Augustus. So he was the man that took a republic and converted it into an empire. And in doing so, the Roman Senate was so overwhelmed with the power that he displayed that they actually uh, put in his name this idea that he was God or divine or savior. So they actually gave that title to him. And one of the things he did with that power and with that title is he established this this policy called Pax Romana, which was the peace of Rome. So this great savior of Rome brought, brought this peace to Rome, but the peace was established at the end of a sword. So he brought tyranny and he brought this sense of fear and that brought compliance and that established the peace. So in that sense, people understood peace in a certain context. And so if uh, Herod was Vader, well, here the Caesar is Palpatine, all right? He is the overlord and emperor of the entire world. But for him to have this peace and to have this sense of, quote, calm, that was expensive. 
you needed to mobilize a military, you need to have them spread in a lot of different regions. And so what we see here is that he needs to increase his tax base to fund his military established peace. And so he's now taking a census to get a head count to figure out who else he can tax and therefore he can get more money. And what's weird about that is like, oh, how do you actually oppress people the best? Well, you tax the very people you're going to oppress and you use the money to oppress them more. He's a smart guy. And so this is what he sets out to do. And so it says in verse 4, because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judah, or Judea, uh, to David's ancient home. And so he traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was now expecting a child. And so to fulfill the census, he has to go back to this ancestral home. And this is a 70-mile trek through the desert with a woman in her third trimester. Ladies, we don't let you get on a plane in that trimester. We don't let you take a cruise, right? And now they're going to have to slough through the desert. And by the way, you will not see anywhere in the story that it says Mary rode a donkey. That's another one I'm going to ruin for you just for fun, all right? So no donkey. No, she might as well read a, rode a Peloton for all I know. Like we could start making up stories all day, right? We, it doesn't say she wrote anything. So all we know is that they had to make this really arduous trip in very challenging circumstances. And they're going to this town known as Bethlehem, the house of bread. That's literally what it means, the house of bread, which I love because Jesus is the bread of life to be born in a place called the house of bread. And he takes Mary. And this is interesting because, again, this is that nuance in the story that if you don't understand the culture, maybe it gets lost a little bit. But notice that it said that they were engaged. So they're not married yet. So in that society, for a young man and a young woman to travel together unmarried is scandalous. And the only reason Joseph would risk taking this young girl in her late, late, like, weeks of pregnancy is because he knows that leaving her is more dangerous than taking her. Because in their culture, they're not looking at Mary going, yeah, we believe you, God put this child in you, right, I bet, you know. No, she's unmarried, he's unmarried, she's pregnant, it all looks bad, and if he leaves her behind, she may be in some peril, so instead he decides to take her with him because she has a scarlet letter in their town. And so, however they get there, they get there. They take this hard road, and it's this hard reality. But one of the things that Luke is doing as he opens the story in the way that he does is he's showing this spiraling down effect of the characters to get to the center point of the story and showing how the story is backwards from the way the world does things. It's scandalous again. Because how does it start? It starts with an emperor. That in his power, on his throne, with his might, makes a decree for the whole world, right? That's how it starts. And then from that, the governor, Cornelius, he executes the decree in that particular region. And so this man, Joseph, complies with the decree. Mary accompanies the man who is applying the decree that has been given. But the story is about the last character, the least in the list, the child. And yet this is just highlighting something Jesus will say more than once in his ministry, that it's the last who are first. So at the top of the list is what the world says is might. At the bottom of the list is what the world says is weakness. And yet the kingdom is all about weakness as true strength. So it says in verse 6, while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. And she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Now again, we sometimes picture this scene where it's late at night, it's blustery, it's dark, it's cold. Here comes Joseph with this donkey and Mary riding in labor and they frantically come into town and they go to the inn and the innkeeper says, no space here, find something else. And so Joseph's freaking out and he's like, Mary, I don't even know what to do. Even Motel 6 turned off the light. I'm on my app for like Airbnb. There's nothing, like there's this frantic thing, right? That's the way we kind of picture it. Here's what the story says. And while they were there, the time came. So it's not like they frantically entered town and couldn't find a hotel room. 
No, they had been there for a little while. Might have been days, might have been weeks. We don't know how long they were there. But they were there. But they were there in conditions where there was no family to give them a room. There was no space that they can find. There wasn't like inns. I mean, don't see like a bed and breakfast. It didn't work that way back then, not in that small town. So, so they were just, they couldn't find lodging with family members realistically. And part of that may have been that family was like, they're not married, she's pregnant. Uh, you know what, we, we, we don't want you in the house, but we, we do have where we keep the animals. So maybe it was a cave nearby, or maybe it was like the basement dwelling of a home that was meant only for the animals. Either way, the whole scene is meant to convey this idea of utter lowliness. And yet that loneliness, this idea of this cave for animals, right? It, it, it's meant to, again, subvert our preconceived notions of greatness, of power, of entitlement, of worth. And so you have this carpenter, right, turn midwife suddenly, right? Men didn't deliver babies in their culture. And this is just a young man. Imagine these callous hands that work in stone and wood suddenly trying to soothe his, his, his kind of engaged. Maybe at this point they, they sealed a covenant, but he hasn't known her yet. Maybe they, it really happened in just a very small window. At this point it says they're just engaged. But he's here trying to do this thing that is beyond his pay grade. And for Mary, normally your mother was there with you or some female relatives. Nobody appears in the story. It seems that it's just this kind of frightening, cold, uncomfortable, shocking environment. And then the baby comes into the world, cries out into the cold air of a cave. And they quickly cocoon the child and the king of kings is laid in the trough of livestock. Right? The greatest king to ever face the planet is not born into a golden cradle, but he's just born into this common thing for animals. And so God asks hard things of this couple, and then he placed them in a hard environment. And what I realize in this story is oftentimes God's best things, his most profound stories, require the hardest things of us. The hardest but this is the way that he himself is willing to travel. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, it says, You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. Born into the most impoverished conditions you could imagine, as a symbol and sign of how he was to remove our spiritual, moral, and, and soul poverty. Right? That's what he's going to do. And this poverty is accented with the next note in the story. It says in verse 8, That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Now again, we get images in our mind of shepherds, but you have to understand in the first century, a shepherd was seen as a thief, was untrustworthy, and a little bit detestable. There was actual laws in place that said, hey, if you have to go through some type of legal situation, you're going to go to court in some way, you can't call a shepherd as a witness because they're unreliable and you don't want them there. right? So shepherds are not like, oh, how sweet, how great. No, not like. They were in the same list as tax collectors and like uh, gamblers. They're that category of people. And even religiously, because most of what a shepherd did required them to be religiously or ceremonially impure almost all the time. Even religions, like, man, they're just constantly sinful. So to try and understand who these guys are, they have names like Cooter and Zeke, right? They're like that, and they date their cousins, drink moonshine, think they've been abducted by aliens. They're like those kinds of guys, right? Not the kind of guys that you go like, hey, we're going to have a baby gender reveal party. Let's put them on the list. Right? They're not on the list. They're not those guys. Nobody wants these guys around. It's scandalous that these guys suddenly appear in this story. And yet it's these types of people that are going to see the fulfillment of an ancient prophecy. It's in Micah, where Micah wrote, But you, O Bethlehem, are only a small village among all the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past will come from you on my behalf. 
and he will stand to lead his, lead his flock with the arm or with the Lord's strength, and in his majesty, in the name of the Lord his God. That is how he's going to magnify that strength, and he will be the source of peace for the people. And now centuries later, heaven pierces the atmosphere of earth, and peace comes to the least of the flock. Right? Not the shepherds of the people, but the shepherds of sheep. The people that nobody were interested in. It's there that suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were filled with great fear. I'm sure they were like, I told you, UFOs! right? Because like, they're kind of hicks, right? But they're freaked out. And then the angel reassured them and said, do not be afraid. And I always laugh at this. I'm like, man, if a portal from another dimension opens up in front of you, typically Thanos comes out or something like that, right? It's like, I've seen Avengers. That's a freaky thing. I'd be freaked out. But instead, the angel said, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people, right? And notice there's just a little juxtaposition. They felt great fear. And the angel says, no, this is great joy. Great joy, because good news has come, not only to you as shepherds, the people that nobody cares about, but to all people. That's this good news of great joy. It's for the world. And so what is this advent of good news of great joy? Well, it says in verse 11, the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign you will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Now for Luke's audience, this is a tale of two kings. Remember the inscription earlier. Caesar was known as Savior, as Messiah or Anointed One, and as Lord. He was known as the beginning of the good news of peace, but it was peace that produces fear because it was peace driven by fear. In contrast to this, we see Christ, who is Savior and Messiah and Lord, who is the beginning of the good news of peace, but it's a peace that produces joy. One sits on a throne of power, and the other lies in a bed of weakness. It's just a tale of two kings. Because God's liberator, as he comes into the world, comes as an oxymoron of everything we consider to be strength and might and power and kingship and greatness. And he doesn't simply come as uh, the Messiah of the Lord. He comes as Messiah who is the Lord. That's different. He is the Messiah who is the Lord. And the sign of this king, right? It's not a throne. And also on this night, it doesn't seem to be a star. Again, the star seems later in the story. On this night, the sign of the king is the child in the trough. So it's a lowly sign given to lowly men of a king who comes to the poor and powerless. Yet before these shepherds hoof it to Bethlehem, heaven peels back the curtain a bit more. So suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven. So now, suddenly, the armies are marshaled. In the same way that Caesar marshals an army at the end of a sword is peace in his world. Here, heaven's armies are marshaled, and then they begin to praise God and say. It does not say they sing. It says they say. Sorry to spoil that one for us, too. But they praise and they say. They say, glory to God in the highest heaven. Peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. If I simplified what that phrase is all about, you know what they're chanting? Peace through grace. Peace through grace. Peace through grace. Imagine thousands, millions of angelic beings just chanting together in unison, peace through grace. And the evidence that it's peace through grace is this. It does not say peace on earth to those whom please God. It's peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. See, if it was those who please God, then we mean we'd have to work good enough, hard enough, and well enough to please him. But we can't. Uh, what this is is all about the grace of God showing his pleasure toward us. And so they're just chanting peace through grace, peace through grace. And so again, it's the comparison. Caesar deploys an army right, for peace through military power. God, however, deploys an army to celebrate peace 
through the Savior's rescue. Very different. In fact, one of the Stoic philosophers of this period wrote this, While the emperor may give peace from war on land and sea, he is unable to give peace from passion, from grief, or from envy. For all that he does, he cannot give peace of heart. See, the emperor was impotent in his abilities to do that, but this king is different, right? And so these lowly men stand awestruck of an army that chants about the peace of God's grace. And when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that, the, that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. What's cool about this is, again, here's these people who are not allowed to be witnesses in court. They become the first witnesses of the Christ. Right? It's like God just inverts everything, does it different. So it says, after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what, that, what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. And all who heard the shepherds were astonished. And so the first sermon comes from a teenage girl. The first re- record of writing in the New Testament comes from a disqualified priest. And then the first witnesses are unsavory men. That is the strange stuff of this new kingdom this king is establishing. So different, Right? No wonder it says, but Mary kept all of these things in her heart and thought about them often. I'm sure she was like, this child, in this place, to these people. Like, God, what are you doing? What are you up to? How are you going to unfold this story? It closes with, the shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Here's what I think is really kind of cool about this little nugget right here. Um, At that point, they they went back to their flocks, right? It doesn't say that they said, we're giving up our jobs, we're getting on the speaking circuit, we're going to fill up coliseums with the message that we have. They don't do that. They just go back to their flocks, back to their regular life, back to their status in life, but they go back as changed people. It says they were praising, right? They were praising and glorifying. In other words, they take over where the angels left off. And they're praising and glorifying and they're excited about all of this because they have tasted of the scandal of God's world-shaping grace. They have been moved and altered by this unfolding, powerful kingdom. In fact, I want to close with a quote from N.T. Wright about this section of the Bible. He says, the point Luke is making is clear. The birth of this little boy is the beginning of a confrontation between the kingdom of God and all of its apparent weakness and insignificance and vulnerability, and that is set against the kingdoms of the world. Augustus never heard of Jesus, but within a century or so, his successors in Rome had not only heard of him, but were taking steps to obliterate his followers. Within just over three centuries, the emperor himself became a Christian. When you see the manger on a card or in a church, don't stop at the crib. See what it's pointing to. It is pointing to the explosive truth that the baby lying there is already being spoken of as the true king of the world. The rest of Luke's story will tell us how he comes into his kingdom and how his kingdom comes to us. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for such a wild, unanticipated story. Thank you that your way of grace subverts everything we understand. Every bit of our sense of earning, of value, of worth, things that we accomplish and do, ways that we hold other people accountable to accomplish and do. You you just take it all on yourself. You take it all on you for us. As we have seen the start of this story, we thank you that within the story are all these little clues and cues to the gospel itself and the fact that you are the Savior of the world. We thank you for good news of great joy in your name. Amen.